it's a great pleasure now uh, to introduce Dave Beauchamp. Uh, Dave is, is a fisheries biologist with a, a worldwide reputation. He got his degrees from the University of Washington. He's currently a professor there, along with an appointment uh, through the USGS. Um, oh, Charles, you shouldn't have. Thank you. <laughs> um, and and um, uh, he's, he's worked on Lake Tahoe for a long time. After completing his PhD, he actually did a, a postdoc uh, for several years studying the fishes of, of Lake Tahoe. So you're all here to listen to Dave, not to me. Uh, so on that, unless Charles wants to say something else. Of course. Uh, a brief announcement. Uh, I think uh, all of you knew that Heather got the special award from the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. <laughs> I only found out about it uh, reading the newspaper today. So, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's and, and, when, and when Dave was doing his postdoc here, Charles was, uh, was his ad advisor. Um, so on that note, thanks. All right. That musical note. Thanks, Jeff. Well, uh, I was trying to figure out, it's been probably 15 to 20 years since I was working up here, so it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to get back involved again. And what I'm going to try and do is piece together some of the information that we've acquired uh, in the past. And we just did get underway about two months ago, so I will be showing you a snippet of what we're doing currently and try and synthesize that uh, in a way that we can start to address a few questions uh, related to this open water food web in, in Lake Tahoe. We're focusing on that because historically the Lahontan cutthroat trout were pelagic. And also during my previous stints here in, in Lake Tahoe and, and actually most of the other studies, we've been under a gun in terms of our ability to sample the open water environment for pelagic fish. And so I'm real excited to be able to take that on with uh, more capability now. And I'll show you what, what we mean as we go along. I'd also like to just take a minute to acknowledge uh, some of the collaborators here. I've got two graduate students that are working on a project. Allison McCoy is uh, going to do her master's degree on this. Adam Hansen is doing this uh, just on a small level. He's providing some hydroacoustic expertise to, uh, to help out Allison. And then U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is providing funding and <coughs> vessel support that's uh, getting us out there uh, onto the water. So with that, let's uh, get going. You're probably all aware of this since I stole this uh, off, of, off the website here. Um, what I primarily want to show you, though, is that uh, we've had a variety of fish that have been introduced throughout time. Uh, before 1940, the Lahontan cutthroat trout were extirpated from this, uh, this basin, and it was largely uh, thought to be uh, a cause from overharvest, degraded streams. We don't really know what role, if any, the food web played uh, at that point, and so that's one of the mysteries that uh, <coughs> kind of affect uh, how we view uh, the project currently. And then very significantly, uh, Mysis relicta was introduced and then became established in the lake uh, later on and had a, a fairly a very extreme effect, uh, not the least of which was the extirpation of Daphne, a major zooplankton resource, and a uh, whole cascade of events that occurred as a result of uh, this introduction. So what I want to do is just briefly go through how we're trying to approach this question here. And so what we're trying to do is examine the current lake conditions and ask the question about how uh, food web interactions uh, in relation to how it was historically and currently uh, are projected to affect these relationships with Lahontan cutthroat trout and either pose some obstacles or facilitate uh, growth and survival of these fish at different life stages. So we want to consider a series of filters that are both uh, in terms of the physical processes that are underway as well as the biological ones. And we'll use these as hypotheses to try and examine uh, what types of what types of processes are actually influential in affecting the population dynamics of not just Lahontan and Cutthroat, but the existing populations here. And we can address these hypotheses both by synthesizing some of the existing information we have and then plugging holes based on directed sampling that we're uh, currently underway uh, trying to do right now. 
So first, let's try to define the niche in terms of some of the physical habitat. In large lakes, oftentimes uh, temperature really derives much, much of what's going on with the upper trophic level uh, animals, primarily because these are all mobile. Fish can move around. They have uh, their own temperature tolerances, and so they can move to areas that uh, can either optimize their growth or minimize some stress. And so it's often a very strong structuring feature in large lake habitats. And then we'll also consider some of the ecological interactions that are underway. Things like what food is available to them, are there competitors that are also uh, potentially reducing that same food supply, and are there predators that uh, could pose significant mortality on these fish directly, or actually take them out of their normal ball game and alter their behavior such that they uh, have either less access to food or it alters their growth uh, in environment in some other way. So how do all these, these factors interact? We often see that these ecological factors are mediated by the environment in which you're in. So you could have the same collection of species in a different lake, and because the, either the bathymetry of the lake or the environmental conditions that are there, you'll see uh, some radically different responses. And so it's, uh, it's a little bit risky to play the game of uh, using anecdotes and applying them from one system to another. Uh, because there are mechanisms that are underway, what we're trying to do is understand these mechanisms because what worked in one system doesn't necessarily work in others. Okay, so we'll go back and, and talk a little bit about the environmental niche. And, and again, this is going to be both a, fact, a, a function of the, the thermal regime within the lake, but also how the fish respond to it. So we're going to have to delve into bioenergetics briefly uh, to tell you uh, a bit about how fish respond in terms of uh, their growth regime across a range of temperatures. What temperatures optimize growth? Which temperatures actually suppress or even put them into a negative growth environment so that they, they may be able to tolerate that for a short period, but over the long run they're going to starve uh, or they'll be debilitated and some other cause of mortality will, will remove them from the population. Okay, so we'll look at the thermal regime in the lake, and that'll be uh, in terms of looking at the, the vertical temperature profiles on a monthly basis, and then we're going to overlay that with the bathymetry of the lake so that we know that bottom landscape, how that intersects with uh, the thermal regime to give us a better sense for where this open water pelagic habitat uh, ends and where that benthic habitat starts up in relation to the thermal regime. And then we'll come back and, and uh, overlay some of the ecological interactions that, that may play out there. And so uh, there are going to be a couple of these slides uh, that have some graphs here, so just bear with me a little bit. Uh, on the x-axis, what we have is temperature, and this spans the range of uh, the temperatures that you might find salmonids in in general. And these, every, every fish species, in fact, invertebrates as well, will have a characteristic set of functions that define how they respond to temperature. This happens to be the functions that uh, would would work for kokanee or sockeye salmon, their, their anadromous equivalent there. And what I want to show you is that if there was unlimited food available, the fish would still be limited in terms of temperature. You see this dome-shaped curve here, that would be the maximum amount of food that they could consume in a particular day uh, based on the temperature they're exposed to. Now, in terms of their energy budget, uh, they lose energy from waste, and so waste is typically a, a, almost a fixed fraction of what they eat. And so if we drop down to this red curve here, this would be the amount of energy that's now left for either growth or all the metabolic types of costs that these, these fish have. And then this green curve on the bottom is the metabolic cost. So instead of seeing this dome-shaped relationship, what we see is metabolism tends to go up exponentially as temperature increases. And so what we have left then is the, the distance between these two curves is the amount of growth that's available to those fish at a given temperature um, if they were feeding at their, at their maximum rate. But in nature, it's un, uncommon for that to happen. Usually food is, is limited to some degree. And so if their ration size goes down to here, then the waste also has to be taken off. And so you've got uh, less less of that energy available for growth, and so naturally they'll grow less. And we'll, what we're going to do now is uh, re remove all, the, one of the, all of these curves, and instead what we're going to do is look at just this 
this space here. So how much growth could they enjoy given the temperature regime that they have? And we're going to play around with uh, different feeding rates so that we can look at, say, a very productive system they could feed closer to this 100% of their maximum consumption. At uh, more moderate feeding rates, they may be at 50%, and then down at lower rates would be 25 or less. And so we can look at how these growth relationships change as a result. And so here, here's that original, this is the growth curve that uh, would have um, resulted from that first set of curves I showed you in that last slide. And then if we reduce their ration to 50% of the maximum, their growth naturally goes down. But the other thing that happens is that the, the, growth, the temperature at which they grow the best also shifts to a cooler temperature. Okay, and then, then that becomes even more extreme if you reduce the, the feeding rate even further. What's probably more important, though, is that their thermal tolerance in terms of them not losing weight also shifts to cooler temperatures here. So there's not much of a change between feeding at their 100% rate or 50% rate. As these lines intersect the, the x-axis here, this is where they would start losing weight if they uh, exceeded those temperature regimes. But if you go from this 50% line to the 20% line, now, instead of being able to tolerate up to about 23 degrees centigrade, now we're backing off to about 17 degrees or so. Okay, so this starts becoming uh, a real pr prohibitive barrier for uh, fish to cross, at least on any sort of a chronic level, because there are real costs involved in them uh, being able to grow. Growing, as you'll see, rela uh, is related to their survival and, of course, reproduction. The bigger these fish are, the more uh, eggs the females can produce, uh, and so you can have a lot more reproduction, more growth, more survival. Everything's better if you're bigger. So, uh, the sorts of things that are going to affect the growth environment are really important in, in terms of defining the quality of the niches that may be available to these fish. The other thing that happens is that not all sizes are created equal. And so what happens, the youngsters, the rates run a lot higher. I think we're used to that, right? The toddlers are just running around like crazy. They're also eating a huge amount relative to what their body size is. And as, you, as we get older, our metabolisms, metabolism slows down. Uh, and we're eating, well, the fish are actually a little more extreme in this, this regard. But what happens is that the maximum amount that they can eat, given their body size, and this is reflected in terms of, say, a percentage of their body weight or a proportion of their body weight. So a fish that's only at one gram, so that'd be about this size here, is feeding at, it, it's capable of eating upwards of 35% of its own body weight in a day. Whereas you go up to a kilogram size fish, now they're only able to eat uh, somewhere around 2-3% of their own body weight in a day. The problem is that this, this feeding curve is a lot steeper than the, the waste and, and metabolic cost curve. And so as these fish get bigger, um, the amount of energy that's available from what they eat declines. And so if a small fish is able to eat at their maximum rate, they have roughly 50% of the energy is still available for growth. They, they can convert that right into growth, whereas these larger adults, this is about a two and a half pound fish here, uh, only about 33% of that energy is actually going to be available for conversion into growth. And so you've got temperature things uh, that can affect the growth environment, but the growth environment, that same location in the water column, uh, its benefit can change based on the size of the fish that occupy that as well. So those are important concepts to keep in mind when we talk about the niche. And so we can pile all this stuff together into these energetics models to do a lot of the bookkeeping for us, and they will have, for a given species, they'll have these curves involved in them. Um, they're an energy balance equation, so it allows us to say if uh, the amount that they eat has to equal the metabolic losses, the waste losses, and then whatever is left over is available for growth there. And so we can either uh, use these models to uh, estimate the amount of consumption uh, that was needed in order to satisfy this growth rate, or we can flip it around and say, uh, how much growth would you get if we specified a certain amount of consumption there? And what makes it easy for us then is we can now focus on just a few types of data that we collect in the field in order to feed the model and use those things as inputs. 
Uh, the other important feature is these models will operate at a daily time step, and so we can start capturing dynamics of things that are happening uh, certainly on a weekly or monthly or seasonal basis, and, and most certainly on an annual basis there. So if there's some important events that happen over a fairly short time frame, uh, if we're sampling to capture that, we can actually integrate that directly into this sort of a modeling framework and try and uh, sort out what those, those trajectories might be. So in the field, what we're trying to do is, is figure out what temperatures these fish are exposed to. So remember, they can move around through the water column and potentially choose their temperature. So what we need to do is overlay that vertical temperature profile from the lake with their position in the water column. And if they're moving up and down in the water column, we have to do a, a, a time budget of how much time they're spending in cooler water and warmer water, and then spread that, uh, do that across the calendar so we can document what their thermal regime would be over time. We also need to know how their diet changes through time. So they may be eating some cert sorts of prey uh, in the spring, and that may transition to other sorts of food items later in the year. And so you want to capture that as well as both their feeding rate changes and their diet changes. And then very importantly, we need to know what their growth rate is over that time, because again, we're trying to balance growth to solve for consumption <coughs> or go the other way around. So we need weight at one point of their life and wait at another point in their life in order to do this balancing act here. And then, not all foods are created equal, and, and the condition of the fish aren't always equal either, so we need to know what the energy content of these food items are. So, if I, if I were to give you a pound of lettuce and have you eat that versus a pound of hamburgers, um, you're going to get a lot more energy out of the hamburgers there than you would the lettuce, and so we need to uh, do that sort of a calculation. And also, as these fish change, uh, both in, in size uh, and condition, their own energy content can change. And so doing the math to figure out how much energy actually is needed to grow that fish is, is going to be important to um, consider when we do this, this type of an analysis. So we can use these models to do a bunch of different types of uh, scenarios, but the, the key thing to note, to note here is that we're, when we're in the field, what we're trying to do is grab the data to feed this part of the model. Okay? We can also use field-generated information to get these energy density values that we would, we would grind up these samples and put them in a bomb calorimeter, and it would tell us how much energy there is per unit uh, mass of those, those uh, tissues. Uh, but we can also use literature values if we don't do that measurement directly as a default. Okay. So now that we've got all this information uh, in hand, what we can do is start talking specifically about Lahontan cutthroat trout in Lake Tahoe. Okay, so we've got three different sizes of fish. Here's that temperature regime again, where I've plotted our growth curves for these guys, uh, assuming they're feeding at a moderate rate of about 50% of their maximum. By and large, if we look across, uh, across the globe, um, fish that are feeding on invertebrates, and especially on zooplankton, we would expect them to feed at somewhere between 50 to 80, occasionally up to 100% of their, their maximum body weight, uh, or their maximum consumption uh, through the year, especially the young guys. If they're feeding more on fish, then uh, we would expect the long-term average to be more around 40% or so. So we're just using these as ballpark figures, but they're grounded in a fair amount of empirical support based on experience in a number of other systems, uh, both large lakes locally and around the world. And what we've done is are plotted these curves for smaller fish that's at five grams, one that's about 20 grams, and one that's at 100 grams here. And so what you're seeing is that the growth rates of the, the larger fish relative to its own body size here is going to be less so than for uh, the smallest one here. And now if we overlay the temperatures that uh, Tahoe offers uh, above the thermocline over the course of the, the summer, and we're going to include October in this because the lake's still pretty strongly stratified through October, uh, it's, it spans this range here, so roughly about 13 degrees or 12 degrees centigrade up to maybe 20-ish. Okay, so what it's telling us is that we're on the warm side of the curve, but there's plenty of scope for growth for certainly the smallest fish, the, the medium-sized fish, and even the larger ones. And as the, 
the thermocline heats up, uh, or I'm sorry, the surface waters heat up, they may move into the thermocline to get access to some of those cooler waters um, to balance out the, the metabolic needs that they have at that point. So all this is doing is, is sort of setting some boundaries on what, what these fish might be capable of, but what we don't know yet is actually what are these feeding rates. What we're going to do is look at the kokanee and use them as a surrogate because early in their life it looks like some of their diets are, are similar to what the historic cutthroat trout diets might have been. And we'll get to that in a minute here. The other key ingredient here is that um, lake trout tend to become very unhappy between 11 and 13 degrees centigrade and so it's rare to find them above 13 degrees centigrade and so you'll often, um, if we look at Here's a bunch of thermal profiles from a couple different uh, years, and we can just overlay that zone where, so this is depth along this axis here, this is temperature, we're getting warmer as we go to the right. Uh, this shaded zone is the zone where the temperatures would be below that uh, 11 degrees, and then the tail is sticking out to the 13 degree zone there. So by and large, we would expect, based on their thermal tolerance, for these lake trout to stay largely uh, below this, say, 25-meter zone. And in fact, back in the 90s when we were doing uh, gill netting all the way down the slope zone of the, of the lake, what we found was the majority of the fish, except very few were in that upper uh, 0 to 25-meter layer. Uh, the majority across all seasons were predominantly in this 25 to 50-meter zone here, uh, and they were dropping off as we got deeper, but by and large, I mean, the bulk of the population as well is below the thermocline there. Okay, so it's not that they won't make little forays up into that warmer water, but they will probably only do that when it's profitable to do so, and I'm actually going to show you an example of that in, in a bit. Okay, so one of the hypotheses that, that uh, are probably essential when we think about reintroductions is, uh, is there going to be... A, a thermal niche that allows the cutthroat some segregation from their primary potential predators, uh, especially during the critical period where maybe those juveniles can get a growth spurt and, number one, grow to outgrow a number of their predators, but also have a chance to disperse and acclimate to the lake uh, as, they, as they enter the system. This, in fact, was found uh, in the fall and leaf study by Al Chokichi et al. Um, but we, you can independently arrive at that just based on first principles uh, as I was developing it here for you. The depth range is going to change a little bit be between fallen leaf and Tahoe, again because of the size of the lake, the thymetry, the thermal <coughs> profiles that we see. And so again, in Tahoe we're talking about this July through October period, uh, the surface through potentially 25 meters, but at least um, that surface to 10 meter layer should be a good hard um, refuge for these fish um, while they're first growing in, in the lake here. Okay. Secondarily, the smaller cutthroat, because of that thermal tolerance, will act, should benefit a bit more than the larger ones. So as they grow, their benefit is they're outgrowing some of their, their predators. As they grow, they may have to shift down to a little more exposure uh, to potential predators, but those are trade-offs that become part of the hypothesis. What, what in fact is going to play out? Uh, when this all occurs. And then what that means then is when we overlay this thermal regime with the, the bathymetric features of the lake, um, if there are shelf zones that are shallow enough, those could create some of these localized refuges uh, that, that could be really critically important for cutthroat trout during key portions of the year. And if we look at Tahoe here, um, you can imagine, now these, these lines are, you know, they're just like a topographic map on a, uh, that you'd see if you're going hiking, but in this case they're going deeper. The problem is it's a pretty crude scale. Each of these lines represents 100 meters or 300 feet uh, deep. So um, these red shaded areas are just, just on a very crude sense highlighting some potential areas where you might expect some, uh, some refuges to play out during those stratified periods. Now, as the lake cools down and destratifies in the, the late fall through spring months, there's not going to be any thermal refuge at that point, but the idea is that these fish have dis dispersed, 
and actually everybody's metabolism is dialing back because the temperature is getting lower. Nobody's eating quite so much at that point, so that, that may be less of an issue uh, when everybody's mixed up uh, in the thermocline later in the year. Okay. Now I mentioned that, that lake trout are capable of moving up into the water column. I'd like to know the source of this, whether Bob or Brandt or Scott or somebody took this photo. I've been trying to figure that out for about 20 years now. But uh, what, this, what this shows actually, it's, it's very, it's, it actually is showing two points. This is actually a lake trout in about 10 meters or less of water during the summer. And there are a bunch of the native minnows this is right along Rubicon here, uh, where, okay, so these fish, it's during the summer, they're above the thermocline in warm water. But on a number of occasions when we've been diving, both uh, when I was working here directly and then when my own students came uh, later on uh, in the 90s, uh, there have been times where we're, we're scuba diving uh, in these very steep slope areas and lake trout will come rocketing up past us uh, into very shallow water. And then five or ten minutes later, they go rocketing back down uh, instead. Now, this photo, what it's capturing is these fish are actually up foraging on the minnows in very shallow water. Well, this is, this is one of the few cases in a lake like Tahoe where this is a profitable venture. Why? Because they can take an elevator. They can go almost vertical uh, up to that shallow area. And this whole zone here is very complex rocky habitat. That's the favorite habitat of all these minnows. You find, if you're going to find a swarm of minnows, they're usually in, in conjunction with this sort of habitat. So the water is very clear in Tahoe relative to virtually everywhere else. That was the other point I was going to make, though. Despite the fact that this is almost distilled water by lake water standards, it's still difficult to see that, that fish, isn't it? And it's even more difficult to find to see these guys here. So even though even though they have some of the better visual characteristics in a lake like Tahoe, they still have limited vision. Um, and so when they go up into the water column, it's not like uh, when you see uh, a lot of the, the open water uh, marine type videos where you can see fish from a long ways away. You're actually somewhat limited here. And the fish are absolutely limited. They, if you could see this. There's actually about a one meter halo around this fish, and it turns out when we do laboratory studies, that's the distance at which uh, a lake trout will react to a smaller fish. Beyond that point, they don't even they don't even, oh, they don't even bother. And so, when they come up into these zones here, they have quick access to an area where there's a high high probability of of running into prey. So it's a predictable area. They can go up forage quickly before their body warms up and then get back down. So you think about a slab of meat, for instance, not to get too, too crass, but it's going to take that a while for it to warm up, right? So you can take it from one temperature and bring it up to maybe 10 degrees warmer, and it's still going to take it a little while to warm up. So if these guys are operating, uh, you know, foraging up here for uh, up to 10 minutes, that's really not long enough for that to, to change their temperature. Now, granted, their gills work more like a radio <coughs> in your car, so I'm, I was exaggerating there. Nonetheless, you can kind of get, the, get a feel for what I'm talking about, is that there is some thermal inertia these fish can, can enjoy when they come up. Forage, if they find the fish, they can pick them off, move, move back down. If they don't find the fish, they zoom back down and uh, maybe try later. So these sorts of areas are probably not going to be great cutthroat habitat initially. But in these zones here, now imagine the fish has to maybe travel uh, a kilometer or so this direction to get up to those depths, uh, you know, to get from an area where it's deep enough and cold enough for them to stay long term. It's less likely, less profitable for them to do that. And, and so that's the reason why some of these shelf areas could potentially be a refuge. Okay, so another, this is part of. Uh, this hypothesis about potential thermal refuges that they set up during some critical periods uh, in their life. Okay, so that's kind of the the, the environmental niche, and we've been uh, toying a bit with some of the ecological interactions that relate to that. Let's talk a little more directly about that now. Okay, so historically, what did the cutthroat feed on? Uh, are those foods still available? Uh, and whether they are or not, are there alternative foods that have also 
emerged uh, in the interim due to all these introductions and, and extirpations that have occurred. Is the food supply, supply sufficient to, to really generate the growth that these, these animals need? Uh, and can, is that food going to be available in the areas that are going to allow them access to it? And then we have to also be concerned about whether there are competitors that are also modifying the, the foodscape out there for these, these animals as well. And then uh, in terms of predation, are there conditions that are going to either uh, make predation a big issue or is it going to, uh, are there periods and, and places that uh, predation can be really minimized? And what we want to do is look at how that all plays out. Okay, so let's get to the the historic food web, this is a nice simplified version of it, where lawn cutthroat trout, especially the young ones, were feeding mostly on zooplankton. Uh, and then as they grew, they incorporate the uh, minnows like to each other, and then also mountain whitefish into their, uh, into their diet. Um, so what we're hypothesizing is that they will emulate that same, uh, that same diet composition to the extent possible when they come back into, into the lake here. Um, what we don't know is how, what role the will play uh, in, in the system. Will they actually contribute to the diet of cutthroat trout, or are they going to be con uh, a um, competitor instead? Uh, that remains to be seen. We expect, again, as the uh, cutthroat trout grow, that they'll eat the minnows, and they'll actually eat, cut, uh, eat the kokanee as well. We know in other lake systems that uh, cutthroat trout are uh, significant predators on, say, juvenile sockeye salmon and also kokanee in a variety of systems. Uh, so that's actually a good thing that we've got we've got a forage base, um, and that they're they have the ability to diversify their feeding portfolio, shall we say here? Okay, and then also, will kokanee and mycids compete for the zooplankton with these small cutthroat trout? Uh, so will there be a window where there's more competition, and then? As the cutthroat grow, do they grow beyond that and, and increase the variety of foods that they can feed on um, and, and persist? Okay, and so as the large cutthroat grow and become more predatory, then uh, they get into the same guild as, say, the brown trout and the lake trout, which feed, uh, the large individuals anyway, feed pretty heavily on some fish. And so, uh, You've got a role. You've got multiple roles where a lake trout and brown trout may be predators, but also the large cutthroat can be predators, and they can eat each other. Okay, so a cutthroat can eat lake trout, they can eat brown trout, lake trout can eat everybody as well. So it, it can go around robin. It's all a matter of access and opportunity. Okay, so this is a more contemporary food web here. So now our apex predator is lake trout, and brown trout would be alongside that. Uh, the lake trout, and very importantly now, they're feeding very heavily on mycids currently. Um, the planktivorous fish, or kokanee, uh, tuichub, lahontan red sides, among other species. The benthic feeding fish, the ones that are feeding on the bottom, are tahoe suckers and sculpin. Then we've got the zooplankton now. We've lost our daphnia, but we do have copepods here. So we've got diaphnus and epichura that are both available. Uh, if we add cutthroat trout, then the, some, of the, whoops, some of the hypothesized um, linkages are going to be that uh, the smaller Lahontan cutthroat, which that line didn't come in, they'll be predominantly feeding on zooplankton, probably some insects, and the question mark is whether or not mice will contribute at all to their diet or not. The large Lahontan cutthroat trout uh, will be feeding on a variety of fishes and potentially be cannibalistic as well. Um, but they'll largely outgrow the size where they would be vulnerable to the lake trout. So we'll show you some of those dynamics here in a bit as well. Okay, you can't talk about Tahoe without talking a bit about the, uh, the role of mycids here, because they really are one of the most influential species in a number of these western lakes after they were introduced. Okay, so for Tahoe, I'm, I'm going to take a very fish perspective on this because there's been lots and lots of other information that, that's come along. So prior to the mycid introduction, uh, the kokanee uh, were averaging, say, 15 to 20 inches long when they reached the size where they were going to spawn. And so that, their average size is indicated by this red line here. After the mycid introduction, of course, we had the crash in the, in the daphnia population. And now we saw this decline 
and the size of the adult kokanee such that uh, it's, it's down around, say, 10 to 13 uh, inches. And, and actually, this time scale only goes to the mid-90s here, so I'm real curious to see where it is currently. Actually, this year, they were actually in the realm of about 12, 13 inches, the, the fish that, that we've been seeing. Actually, I see the guys that are making you guys, what, what size have you been getting your the kokanee at? 10 to 13. Yeah. Last year was better, though. We caught them up to you know, 18, 17 inches. Yeah, one of the things that goes on with the, the kokanee in particular is you notice when you have a lot of them available, their size goes down. So there's this density dependent effect on their growth. So typically when they're bigger, uh, it generally means there's fewer of them. If we're lucky, it meant it was actually a more productive year in general with more zooplankton production. But often, uh, the more they're very, very responsive to their own density out there, especially in these lakes that are relatively unproductive. Okay, so uh, even though we still have quite a lot of population fluctuation in terms of abundance, as indicated by these bars here, the overall size of these fish has declined, and so the overall biomass of, of kokanee in the lake has, uh, has declined as a result uh, of the mycin population. Now, this is work that uh, has never been published, but I just wanted to show you uh, an example of relative effects of different different species in the food web here. What we have on these two curves, the green and the blue, are the bio, estimates of the biomass of adult cocoa pods in the, in the basin. So the blue line would be their biomass, the green line would be their biomass plus production. So the production is the, their growth and maybe reproduction that, that adds some additional uh, cocoa, adult cocoa pod flesh into the, the lake during different months of the year. We've got a couple of years uh, underway here. And then what we have are the consumption rates as estimated from energetics modeling, as I showed you before. These black or these blue boxes here, that's how much the kokanee are eating. In other, in other words, what it's saying is even though this is probably varying a lot, uh, it doesn't vary enough to actually show in relation to the scale of this axis here. And so we're talking about metric tons of of food out here. So in this case, this is 8,000 metric tons of copepod flesh, adult copepod flesh out in the lake there. Um, and then what we have are, this is the amount, of, this is the metric tons of mice consumption on that, on food in order to grow those mice. And, and so what this shows is if mice were only eating copepods, that sometime during certain parts of the year, they could make a living on copepods. But other times of the year, um, there's not enough coconut pod biomass or production to support uh, the, the mices. And in fact, when we look at stable isotope analysis, it indicates that the, the um, mices are actually feeding quite a bit on either phytoplankton or detritus uh, instead. In fact, their signal is very similar to the zooplankton that they're eating. And so probably only a relatively small fraction of their diet is actually composed of cocoa pods. In a way, that's good news in that uh, it reduces their consumption demand on cocoa pods overall and makes them a little less of a competitor. Okay? If we move to a different lake, this is Flathead Lake here, what we see are these are, this is the energy budget of lake trout in Flathead Lake, and what we see are these reddish bars. That's the contribution of mycids to the energy balance of these fish over a broad size range. So from the very juvenile lake trout up to those that are, say, 25 inches long, the majority of their energy is coming from mices. And it's only as these fish get bigger that these all these other colors pop in. Those are the fish contributions to the diet there. So what we see are that mices are very uh, important part of the energy budget, especially for younger lake trout. And it's not just in Flathead Lake. This is work from Gary Fee, who is doing a master's degree with me uh, early on in the 90s. This hatch component, that's all mice. So again, we're seeing that most of the energy density over a range of sizes is composed of mice. And then this is uh, a similar graph from Lake Chelan in, in Washington. It has a similar composition of, of uh, prey there. Again, in this case, the yellow bars, that's the mice. What I want to point out, though, is that 
In the shallow basin, by shallow I'm talking about say 60 to 100 meters deep, uh, mysids compose a much larger fraction of the energy budget for lake trout in that system, whereas you get into the very deep basin, they contribute less. Okay. So when you have this bathymetry where the, the bottom is shallow enough, where it's deep enough to support mysids because of their temperature regime, but it's too shallow for them to get down dark in dark deep water where they can hide from the lake trout. The lake trout can really clean up on them on the bottom. Just they, they're in very high densities there, and it makes for very good food. Okay, so um, we can't talk about uh, cutthroat in the west without talking about the potential for predation here. And so what? But what we see is that the predation impacts between native trout and lake trout vary quite a bit among lakes. So uh, there was an experimental uh, reintroduction of Lahant cutthroat trout up in Fallen Leaf Lake, and we've seen that, uh, that they're surviving there despite heavy predation by lake trout. In fact, uh, they're seeing some spawners up in Glen Alpine Creek and maybe some other tributaries. So uh, that's, that's a fairly encouraging sign in that you're getting fish surviving several years to uh, get to a spawning state. and enough of them that you can actually detect them, because there's a needle in the haystack when you think about looking through time and space to find the spawners. When we look at a variety of other lakes, uh, they also coexist uh, in Bear Lake, uh, where you've got stocked lake trout there. However, we've got dramatic declines in both Yellowstone and Flathead Lakes when we've got these expanding lake trout populations. Um, we've had uh, really precipitous declines in uh, cutthroat trout populations, both in Yellowstone and in Flathead. And in Flathead, there are a number of other species. Kokanee, in particular, just completely went, went uh, bottomed out in that system there. And then in Lake Chelan, which I also showed you earlier, we've got hatchery and wild west slope cuts that are providing a fishery in there. And again, we've got uh, a large population of lake trout. So what's going on? I mean, we, you've, got, you've got similar assemblages of fish, and yet we get, we get these different results. Okay, so that's part of the hypotheses that we're trying to develop here um, through this program is look at what are the mechanisms that will play out and affect the, the level of predation mortality, and is that going to be a significant enough that it's actually regulating the population of cutthroat trout, or is it going to be a minimal effect there? Okay, I think I just said that. Okay, and, and as an example, and this is Bear Lake, if we look at different snapshots of the food web in different seasons of the year, so spring, summer, fall, and winter, and I just want to highlight these red arrows are, these are juvenile Bear Lake cutthroat trout, and in the spring, when you don't have thermal stratification, you have pretty heavy predation by both the lake trout and the cutthroat trout, cannibalizing their own uh, brethren there. In the summer, you do have thermal stratification. You have a little bit of cannibalization going on by the cutthroat trout, but the lake trout are, are largely laying off of them and staying down, feeding on deeper water prey. Okay, in the fall, not much going on. In the winter, uh, again, things are dialed back, so yeah, they're feeding on them, but at a low rate, um, and there all, are alternatives. Part of the reason in Bear Lake, again, it's a tilt block lake rather than a graven lake here where you had the whole floor of the lake just kind of dropped in Tahoe. In Bear Lake, it just kind of tilted on one side. And so you have these vast areas of, of relatively shallow zones that could provide refuge for the cutthroat trout in that zone uh, relative to the, the temperatures that need to be cold enough for the lake trout down in this area here. Okay, so. Um, to finish out the predation part, we just want to mention the critical uh, relationship between growth and uh, predation. So I said initially that big is better for these fish. Part of the reason for that, again, I'm going back to some other lakes as examples. This is uh, a relationship of the size of lake trout that have eaten fish prey, and this is the size of the fish prey that we find in their gut. So we've got color-coded prey. These red ones are kokanee. The green ones are, are uh, lake white fish. And what we're seeing is that lake trout are capable of eating fish that are up to 50% of their own body length. Right. Okay, so they're capable of that. They, they can do it. They average about 30% uh, of their body length. But you can use these relationships then to start uh, 
going into a particular system and saying, if you've got a, if you know what the size structure of your predator population is, we can now play games like, if this is our prey length, as they grow along this axis here, we can start seeing how different relationships change. So for instance, as kokanee grew in, in Flathead Lake, the abundance of lake trout that were capable of feeding of them on them declined really rapidly. Okay. The biomass, or I should say, and then the numbers of kokanee that were consumed also declined really, really rapidly. Okay. What's happening though is as these fish are growing, their body mass also increases a lot, so it takes fewer kokanee to feed a lake trout. And so this is, although the lake trout are actually eating quite a bit of, of kokanee, that biomass of kokanee that they're eating is translating into fewer and fewer kokanee as well. And so you can play games with, in fact, uh, what the agencies did was they introduced kokanee at this size, and then uh, as the kokanee grew over a few months, they were able to reduce their mortality rate to about five or ten percent of uh, of what would have been initially. And so you can look at, you can customize this sort of analysis to to your particular basin and populations of fish, and and then actually track them through. This is still flathead lake kokanee. What we saw was the size at which these fish were first stocked into the lake as yearlings uh, at about six inches long or so. Uh, this was in May, and then July, August, and October, there, you can see them growing. It wasn't until October that they outgrew the majority of their, of their predators. But if they're outgrowing those predators during the time when they're thermally segregated, then that works. If they're not thermally segregated, then, uh, then you've got a bigger problem in terms of potential predation. Okay, so we're trying to compile all this stuff and, and then put that in the context of what we're doing currently here. And so what we're, what we're really focused on is what's the distribution and abundance of different key elements of the food web in the pelagic or open water zone of, of Lake Tahoe. And so to get at the fish and to some degree the mice, we're using hydroacoustics, that's essentially just sonar, but it's a scientific grade sonar that allows us to quantify fish by density uh, in different layers of the water column and by size. So all these red lines you're seeing are transects that we're taking across the lake and we're shooting down through the water column. We're also do, gonna do midwater trawling, so those layers that have a little bit higher densities of these pelagic fishes, we're gonna use those to target midwater trawling so we actually get our hands on these fish. This is the exciting part for us in that we've never had the capability. In fact, if we look at lakes around the west, um, it's actually quite hard to, to get usable numbers of fish uh, with, with netting gear. Uh, and particularly, it's challenging in a lake that has this, the low productivity that Lake Tahoe has. And so having a uh, fairly capable midwater trawl will, will give us the opportunity to get our hands on biological samples so we can actually see whether or not all these pelagic fish are, in fact, kokanee or they could actually be some of these native minnows that are pelagic. Historically, they were pelagic, but how far offshore did they actually go? Were they just kind of creating this halo around the lake, or do they actually uh, make use of the whole open water arena? We haven't really had the capability of knowing that until, until uh, doing this midwater trawling, so that's another reason for some excitement there. Zooplankton sampling, uh, we're just specializing in a couple areas for now, but we're doing a depth stratified sampling. So we're looking at the density in the upper 10 meters, so that's above the thermocline, then within the thermocline, and then a swath through the, uh, below the thermocline. So we get an idea of how the, the densities of zooplankton play out, so we know what the trade-offs are for these fish if they select a habitat based on the thermal regime. What's the food payoff to them in those zones? And we're doing these, we're doing some repeated transects across different areas that have different bottom depths so we can see if there's some pattern there. Again, at a pilot level right now to try and sort out what's going on. We hope to be able to tap into the long-term data set uh, from the offshore sampling as well to see and, and use that in conjunction with these data to play back and forth between what's the time series look like versus some of this more tactical level sampling that's going on currently. And then we're doing vertical mycid 
halls, uh, through the water column, at all these spots that have these black, um, these black squares here. So we're using a one meter mycid net in diameter. Here, here it is. It has a one millimeter uh, opening mesh size to it, and we're, we'll be towing that up through uh, about the from about 100 meters to the surface. From our acoustic work, it looks like at night that scattering layer of mycids comes up. Uh, primarily to 60 meters, and uh, Peter's, so if we go down to about 100 meters deep, we're actually capturing the lower end of that pretty well. And so we can look at how many, what's the density of mycids in, say, this area of lake bottom. Essentially, we're, we're kind of scooping everything up that would have been on, the, on a lake bottom there, and we can, we can um, talk about mycids in terms of uh, their density per a square meter or hectare in the lake, as well as on a volumetric basis later on. So this is a schematic of what hydroacoustics looks like. You're sending sound down through the water. You can actually quantify the density of fish by size in different layers of the water column. And you can get an output like this that uh, also gives you a pictorial of what uh, what's in the water column. This is not Lake Tahoe, by the way. Um, if you do it during the day periods, you can get a sense for what the distribution patterns look like then. Oftentimes you have fish that are schooling. Those schools are very elusive. It's hard to, to actually detect them uh, with a, without a huge amount of effort. But you can see where the different sizes of fish are playing out and even potentially see what the mycid layer looks like at that point. At night, you can see if this mycid layer comes up. Typically, the schools split apart at that point, and that's why we do midwater trawling at night, is because as the fish split apart, it's very hard to find a school. It's a needle in a haystack. But as the fish spread out, now they're, they're more uniformly distributed. I use that term very, very loosely. Um, but it gives you a much greater opportunity to pick them up in a net, and it also makes it easier and, and more accurate to uh, assess them using hydroacoustic gear. And so we can take a midwater trawl through specific depth intervals in the water column and identify what species are actually there, what's the size distribution of them, and then the big benefit is that we're actually getting our hands on biological samples so we can do things like uh, back calculate what their growth is, what's their diet, what's their size, do stable isotopes on them, a whole variety of things that, uh, that feed back into a lot of these other analyses. Okay, so here's just a quick cartoon of Daytime distributions, pretty, pretty low densities out there. This is at dusk, so you're seeing more densities of fish up in this zone here, circled. You can see the mycid layer starting to come up through the water column here. And then at night, uh, you actually see more of these fish targets uh, in this layer centered around about 20 meters. And the mycid layer is, is topping out at between well, about 50 meters or so. Some are approaching a little bit higher. That we can use that interchangeably with the net sampling to do a better job of, of uh, quantifying what's going on uh, in time and space and having the context for how, uh, how they're using the environment, where they're located, and what they're doing at the time. Okay, so this is just a more quantitative version where during daylight, what we're seeing here is depth along this axis. This is the density of fish per thousand cubic meters. So. Uh, this room is maybe half of that volume here. If we stacked, well, maybe a third. If we had three of these rooms stacked into a cube, that would be about 1,000 cubic meters. And so we're seeing a fraction of a fish per 1,000 cubic meters here, according to these densities here. Okay, but during daylight, very, very few single fish available. They're probably in schools at the same depth interval. At night, <coughs> or at dusk, we see the schools disperse and then fully disperse at night, uh, and it, but they're remaining relatively in that same depth interval there. Okay, so that's important. Number one, we can quantify this and actually get abundance estimates on uh, the number of these pelagic fish out there. From the net sampling, we can partition those into different species and size groups. We can also do the size groups from the acoustics itself. Um, and we can also look at how they're distributed through different parts of the lake. So this is the, if we look at the open water, or I'm sorry, here's the open water transects we had going across the north, central, and south region. We're seeing that the densities are, are somewhat similar with a little bit higher density of these pelagic fish in the southern 
most area, but it's, it's rewarding to see that you actually have measurable densities across all three uh, thirds of the lake, if you will. And so that's in the open water area. If we go up and down the slopes uh, over similar depth range, though, we also see that there's uh, reasonably similar densities of fish in those zones as well. So it's telling us that, that the, uh, this deep water community or, or midwater community is, is utilizing a lot of these habitats out there. And then we can, we can start focusing in on, on what they're doing. Okay, we can use that information again. We know what the depth of those fish are. We can overlay that with, with these thermal uh, patterns through time and then plot out what the thermal experience of a kokanee would be over the course of the year. Okay, so they're getting up to maybe 16 degrees in, in September, down to six degrees in the winter time. We can use that as an input into this energetics model I showed you earlier. We can run that model to estimate consumption. But now we can do this for individual, representative individuals from each age or size class of our consumer and then get a consumption estimate of those individuals through time. Now, also recognize that we typically have a lot more of the younger fish than the older fish, so the smaller ones are going to be more abundant than the older ones here. So we can incorporate the size structure and abundance uh, into those consumption estimates to come up with a population level consumption estimate. So how much, uh, how much food is this kokanee population eating on a monthly basis, seasonal basis, or across the year? And then if we know something about the, the prey that they're feeding on in terms of their biomass, then we can actually convert that consumption estimate into a mortality, or what fraction of the, of the overall pie of prey is being consumed by each one of these consumers out there. So I showed you an example based on kokanee but we can do that for these other species, provided that we, we do we sample them in a similar manner. Okay, and just to, I'm just about done, so hang with me for just a second here. So if we look at the consumption of these fish, I'm just doing a simulation. So let's assume we have a million kokanee fry enter the lake from Taylor Creek uh, when they start life. As they start here, and we now we're just going to march through the seasons of each year of their life here. Their abundance is going to go down uh, precipitously. You know, it's a, it's a hard life for a fish. They start with a million, you end up with maybe 80,000 of them or so uh, at the end of their life. But their abundance is going down through time. Their body weight is going up. So we have to factor both of those things in through the life of those fish in order to look at those population level consumption estimates. And these are those consumption estimates based on each age class of kokanee, different, different seasons of the year. Now this is ginned up data just based on the diet information we got from these fish last month. But what we're seeing is they're feeding on mycids, which was interesting. Uh, we, were not, we were expecting them to feed almost exclusively on, on the cocoa pods, so that would be the epicure and the diaphanous, but they're also feeding to a considerable degree on mycids, at least the adults are. Okay, so, this, this can give us an estimate of what biomass every million uh, new co every cohort of a million new uh, kokanee are eating over the course of their life out there. The other really important output of that simulation is that we get a feeding rate in terms of their percent of their maximum. And for the young age zero fish, uh, they're eating at about 34 percent of their maximum rate on average over the their, the whole year. But 45 to 55 percent as we get to these older age classes here. So if you think back to that original graph, and I'm going to show it to you here again, we assume 50 percent maximum consumption. So in fact, these curves are not too far off in terms of the growth potential that these fish should be able to enjoy uh, if they're staying above the thermocline. Uh, and again, like I said, as the fish grow, maybe they have to encroach into the thermocline to stay in a reasonable temperature regime. But it appears that there's sufficient food based on, again, kokanee as a surrogate. So that's the hypothesis, is whether or not these, these uh, cutthroat are going to behave like the kokanee. Okay, so we're virtually done. Uh, I'm just going to call these preliminary find findings and not really conclusions because we're just underway now. Um, it does appear that there's a thermal regime that, uh, that allows for a refuge for these fish, uh, the Lahontan cutthroat, during the stratified period of the year. This could be an effective deterrent against predation, particularly for the younger age classes.
uh, and there does appear to be sufficient food for kokanee. Um, again, the juveniles will probably benefit from, from this the most. Uh, mycids are a very important energy source for both juvenile and adult lake trout, but will they be either a net competitor or a food source for the cutthroat trout and kokanee? That remains to be seen. And then uh, I'm just going to finish with uh, this overall uh, platitude that uh, if we can quantify these interactions through time and space and pay attention to the different life stages that, and do it in as mechanistic a way as we possibly can, it really helps us identify some potential bottlenecks that may uh, inhibit production at various life stages uh, or Op, uh, enhance or look at where there's some opportunities for, for growth to exist. And this, in fact, this will then feed kind of in an iterative manner uh, the research and management options in terms of as we adapt going through different steps, what do we learn? How can we implement that into the next stage of, of this grand experiment here? So uh, thanks for being patient with me. Uh, I'll take questions. Thanks. Significant difference in between the cutthroat and the kokanee that you the kokanee that you're using as kind of a model is the spawning period for kokanee is in October, whereas the cutthroat is in spring, early spring. Yes. So if you're using a thermal refuge, uh, doesn't that throw it off by half a year? And and when the fish fry or juveniles move into the lake, then it, will that affect their predation? Well, uh, what we're focusing on entirely right now is their lake life. So, so for that, so it's entirely relevant for that portion of it. You're right. The entry times are going to be quite a bit different, probably off by about six months in terms of when kokanee come in and when cutthroat trout come in. But cutthroat can also exhibit a, a variety of life stages where you may have some that pulse out almost immediately after they hatch. You've got other life history strategies where they may stay for several years before coming downstream and, and utilizing the lake. We're not even focused on the stream side of the equation right now. We're, answer, we're trying to answer the question of what sort of a niche, uh, what does the niche look like in the, in the lake environment currently? Do, do you have any does any of this tell you, give you any insight as to what happened pre, you know, around 1940 that took the LCT out of the lake? Do you believe that was a lake impact, or is that um, more probably stream? I think, well, I think that it's still, the original idea is still whole. This doesn't dispute that at all. Uh, and probably because a lot of the, the major players that are currently in the mm -hmm. lake didn't even exist uh, during the period when, when the Lahontan cutthroat were reigning supreme. We also don't know really what the trend in, say, the lake trout population was over that whole era there. Um, what we've seen is the lake trout typically take off uh, after mycids <coughs> have come in, but Lake Tahoe has its own interesting nuances in terms of things that may be limiting the reproduction <coughs> of lake trout, too. It seems like there's a lot of lake predators out here. Part of the work I did in the early 90s was uh, looking at what, be, what might be limiting, uh, why we didn't see a lot more uh, evidence of spawning in some of these slope zone habitats that looked like it should be great spawning habitat for a lake trout, and yet we, we saw very little of it. We would see aggregations of fish there, but little to no evidence of spawning. In fact, where we did find positive spawning were in these seamounts that were down in the south end of the lake that were coming up out of really deep water, but the tops of them were around 40 to 50 meters deep. We had weeds on top, carophytes, that were actually providing the structure to hold the eggs there. And uh, the only predators that were out there were lake, bigger, you know, lake trout. Um, so what, what could have been limiting lake trout all along is not so much a, f a food source as just the habitat that uh, suppressed the, lake, the egg predators from them. Whereas in a lot of these other lake systems, um, particularly Flathead, you had this, is, I go back to that one a lot because it's probably the most spectacular example. Um, mice came in in about 1980, and by 1985, um, they established a really strong population. What also was going on at that time, though, was that um, 
the kokanee population was producing about a half million to a million adults. That was both in terms, so the harvest was about 200,000 good sized kokanee, and then another half of those were going up and spawning about 80 miles upstream uh, just below McDonald Lake in, in Glacier National Park. Um, when the mice is established, in the course, so early 80s, you see no evidence of any problem, and then 1985, all of a sudden you go from hundreds of thousands of large kokanee to just a couple thousand, just as fast as that. A year and a half, they were, they were gone. And uh, the, the hypothesis is that these mice, as the mice came in, they were essentially uh, relieved a lot of the, um, the mortality pressure on younger lake trout. Turns out that cannibalism suppresses lake trout populations in a lot of places. And there are a lot of elements to the story. I can't get into everything, but, but there was a lot of evidence of, of cannibalism in Flathead Lake. Um, if you can imagine mice that's coming into a system, the, the lake trout, historically, the young ones, typically are at radically different depths than, their, than the adults uh, in, most, in most of their native range, probably to avoid that very issue. Uh, they don't always have that, that ability in a lake that they've been introduced into. Um, so what may have been happening is they could either seek refuge in, say, rubble piles or what have you, or they have to go out and feed. You know, so if they stayed in the rubble pile, they're going to deplete whatever food is there in pretty short order, and eventually they're going to have to go out and feed uh, around uh, other parts of the lake. When they do that, it makes them vulnerable to predation uh, by these larger lake trout. Now think about what mice do when they come in. They do this diagonal vertical migration where they carpet out on the bottom during daylight and they go up into the water column at night. So they carpet out during daylight, this thick layer of lots of meaty mycids that they can just vacuum up off the bottom during daylight. Even if they deplete that resource locally in that patch of rocks, um, it doesn't matter because those mycids go up, they come back down, they recarpet that same zone. And so even an incremental increase in survival uh, that was imposed by that the, that's our hypothesis about what happened. What, in reality, what we can say is that over those intervening 10 years, the lake trout population went from a very small fraction of the overall lake community to it increased by 20 fold. And at the same time, you had a reciprocal decline in, well, you had a cra complete crash in Kokanee. You had a radical decline in the West Slope cutthroat trout, bull trout, and pygmy whitefish, some of the other native species that were there. But this was in response to a, an absolute explosion in the lake trout population that was mitigated by uh, a new introduction of yet another uh, non-native uh, food source there. So for the longest time, the argument was that mice were just out-competing kokanee for the, the zo zooplankton, and so they weren't growing as well. But if you actually piece it out, yeah, the kokanee would have grown less, but you wouldn't have had this massive mortality rate. Yeah. So I'm kind of I'm kind of just uh, tickling the edges of what may have occurred here in, in Tahoe, but I don't think that the food web uh, was directly responsible for their extirpation originally. I think there's been other pieces of the puzzle. Certainly, uh, you know, the deforestation of the basin, the, the decline in, in the quality of the tributaries as a result of that, the, the really strong over harvest of those large Lahontan cutthroat trout historically as well. Um, that conventional, that's the conventional wisdom currently is that um, that led to the demise of, of the cutthroat in this lake here. And so far, we find nothing to refute that. Yeah, John. Yeah, any, um, any results from the, um, the uh, stock in follow with like for LCTs that gives any um, Indication on this on the shelf and this immediate level of refuge? Well, it seems like the same things are, are have been made. Al Chokichi paper was indicating that there was a, a depth at which the lake trout generally stayed below that. The cutthroat tended to stay above that. But again, it only lasts during, during that thermally stratified period. Okay. Uh, fall of leaf lakes a much smaller lake, so a lot of you know, the scale of the issue is is a big question here. Um, and I don't, I'm not aware of how much follow-up evaluation has been going on in order to really do it. It's it's very hard to track uh, 
fish through their entire life stage. That's why I say it's impressive to actually see evidence of spawners because um, there, a lot has to go right for um, fish to to survive that long. As I as I showed you, just natural uh, survival rates are such for a fish that you don't get very many that survive from the initial number. Um, they both survived and they found uh, appropriate spawning habitat there. But in terms of the actual numbers, uh, other people probably know more than I do currently about uh, what the status is there. Hey, Charles. Um, at some point, you'll probably have to include in your model uh, the fact that the surface waters are warming yes. so, so much more rapidly than the, the whole water column. And this will thin the epilimnion and uh, provide maybe too hot a refuge. <clears throat> yeah, it both changes the volume and, and creates a warmer refuge there. That's right. Um, in, in other systems, this is an interesting counterintuitive result of that is, again, using kokanee and lake trout, mycins and, and zooplankton. Some reservoirs in Colorado where they saw these years where there was <coughs> less, less snowfall, uh, so the reservoirs in general were lower. Uh, it was hotter overall, so you had a very strong but thin thermocline set up. That was actually advantageous to the kokanee and the daphnia because it segregated them from the mycids and lake trout. And, they, and so the kokanee could happily feed away at the, at the daphnia. The daphnia were at a temperature where they could reproduce really quickly and they were in that, that upper photic zone. Uh, the lake trout had to settle for mycids as their only food during that, that time. Okay, so that'll work for a while if you if climate trends even further. Then, of course, we get into an area where it becomes much much warmer, and and we have to reevaluate how that whole thermal regime plays out for sure. Okay. One interesting difference between fall leaf lake and Tahoe <laughs> is that at Tahoe, because of the greater width, and uh, you get these, we get these significant thermal uplevelings, particularly in the spring and the summer. And those areas you were showing as potential thermal ref refugia would actually, you know, once a week, get this cold water coming up, almost a, an elevator. So it, it may be interesting to see if there are differences between the west shore and yes. the east shore, where the thermal, where the uplevelings don't seem to ever occur. Yeah, the and then north-south, too. So yeah. those areas that have the more gradual slope as opposed to the uh, a shelf with, with a fairly steep drop off or that sorts of topography can have uh, a lot of influence. Certainly we see that when we look at, uh, I do similar work out in, in, in the ocean and so for instance the Gulf of Alaska you see that the bathymetry there really really has an impact on, on generating production of the phytoplankton and zooplankton and it will, will create some hot spots for uh, fish but there's a disconnect at that level uh, because there are three or four different things that can happen that are all equally plausible and they all go in opposite directions. Yeah. Hey, John. Just another question on that. So when you're using the protein, is that, is, 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 is that good for the, for the whole life history of the uh, no, I mean, we're really only using them as a, as a way to kind of calibrate what would a plank, can we expect a planktivorous fish to feed at a reasonably high rate or a low rate there? And that's really all we're trying to do with the, with the company. We've got models generated for the capture the physiology of cutthroat trout explicitly, but what we don't have are cutthroat trout in, in Lake Tahoe right now that we can track and, and, and check their performance. So. Absent that, right now we're, we're just looking at what is another planktivore that historically looked like they, at least the juvenile long cutthroat trout, were filling a similar niche to what, what the kokanee currently are. Let's take a look at how a kokanee are feeding and, and, uh, and sort out whether or not that gets us in the ballpark there. I have a question, not, not for Dave, but actually for some of the people who remove fish from lakes for a living. I mean, Dave has been touching on some of the history and the trends that the data has shown. I mean, did you hear anything that maybe differs from your own experiences? Like that? 
my experience is that the fish travel around the lake all the time, yeah. and not the same area. But, but, high, but, but seasons, but the overall trends of increasing and decreasing fish in the lake, is that? I think there's more suspended fish the last couple of years. And I found that different this year. Where we used to fish for the coconut and catch a lot of lake trout underneath them, like some years, five, seven years ago, I mean, you catch a dozen lake trout underneath the coconut. This year, we caught some nice lake trout underneath them, but nowhere near the numbers. How are the coconut catches this year? We caught in our fleet probably 70,000 coconut this year. And the year that you saw lots of lake trout hanging underneath them? Uh, was very good. Was that the same or better even? Yeah, or? yeah. Yeah, we like to be able to string those observations together and look at, uh, you know, can can we start predicting when lake trout shift to foraging mode, or at least when enough so that we can detect it, so that they're feeding morphologically or not. And uh, in order to do that, you would expect that there'd be a lot more food available, so it, it's a more predictable source for them to to actually venture out offshore and go for them. Because the default really is uh, if if they can't find those pelagic fish very very well, then they're going to fill up partially on mycids and then do this kind of slope crawl to, to get at those uh, you know, things like crayfish and uh, minnows and the fish that are closer to, to the slopes on there. Yeah, well, thanks, everybody. Well, this is the get our feet wet here to try and get reacclimated to the lake itself and, and try and plug some of the, the data gaps that we knew existed from the long term. Um, we were actually needing to have meetings to, to plan what's going to happen in the future here. So, um, presumably multi multi year, but. Uh, all we're going to do is set the context for how we plan plan future research and you know, hopefully tie in with a lot of folks in the school as well. Okay, so if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank Dave and thank you all for coming to the end. I'd like to just take a minute to acknowledge uh, some of the collaborators here. I've got two graduate students that are working on a project. Allison McCoy is uh, going to do her master's degree on this. Adam Hansen is doing this uh, just on a small level. He's providing some hydroacoustic expertise to, uh, to help out Allison. And then U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is providing funding and some of the vessel support that's uh, getting us out there uh, onto the water. So with that, let's uh, get going. You're probably all aware of this since I stole this uh, off, of, off the website here. Um, what I primarily want to show you, though, is that uh, we've had a variety of fish that have been introduced throughout time. Uh, before 1940, the Lahontan cutthroat tr trout were extirpated from this, uh, this basin, and it was largely uh, thought to be uh, a cause from overharvest, degraded streams. We don't really know what role, if any, the food web played uh, at that point, and so that's one of the mysteries that uh, <coughs> kind of affect uh, how we view uh, the project currently. And then very significantly, uh, Mysis relicta was introduced and then became established in the lake uh, later on and had a, a fairly, a very extreme effect, uh, not the least of which was the extirpation of Daphne, a major zooplankton resource, and a whole cascade of events that occurred as a result of uh, this introduction. So what I want to do is just briefly go through how we're trying to approach this question here. And so what we're trying to do is examine the current lake conditions and ask the question about how uh, food web interactions uh, in relation to how it was historically and currently uh, are projected to affect these relationships with Lahontan cutthroat trout and either pose some obstacles or facilitate uh, growth and survival of these fish at different life stages. So we want to consider a series of filters that are both uh, in terms of the physical processes that are underway as well as the biological ones. And we'll use these as hypotheses to try and examine uh, what types of 
what types of processes are actually influential in affecting the population dynamics of not just the hot and cutthroat, but the existing populations here. And we can address these hypotheses both by synthesizing some of the existing information we have, or quality will we'll remove them from the population. Okay, so we'll look at the thermal regime in the lake, and that'll be uh, in terms of looking at the, the vertical temperature profiles on a monthly basis, and then we're going to overlay that with the bathymetry of the lake so that we know that bottom landscape, how that intersects with uh, the thermal regime to give us a better sense for where this open water pelagic habitat uh, ends and where that benthic habitat starts up in relation to the thermal regime. And then we'll come back and, and uh, overlay some of the ecological interactions that, that may play out there. And so uh, there are going to be a couple of these slides uh, that have some graphs here, so just bear with me a little bit. Uh, on the x-axis, what we have is temperature, and this spans the range of uh, the temperatures that you might find salmonids in in general. These Every, every fish species, in fact, invertebrates as well, will have a characteristic set of functions that define how they respond to temperature. This happens to be the functions that uh, would, would work for kokanee or sockeye salmon, their, their anadromous equivalent there. And what I want to show you is that if there was unlimited food available, the fish would still be limited in terms of temperature. You see this dome-shaped curve here. That would be the maximum amount of food that they could consume in a particular day. Uh, based on the temperature they're exposed to. Now, in terms of their energy budget, uh, they lose energy from waste, and so waste is typically a, a, some, almost a fixed fraction of what they eat, and so if we drop down to this red curve here, this would be the amount of energy that's now left for either growth or all the metabolic types of costs that these, these fish have. And then this green curve on the bottom is the metabolic cost, so instead of seeing this dome-shaped relationship, what we see is metabolism tends to go up exponentially as temperature increases. And so what we have left then is the, the distance between these two curves is the amount of growth that's available to those fish at a given temperature um, if they were feeding at their, at their maximum rate. But in nature, it's un, uncommon for that to happen. Usually food is, is limited to some degree. And so if their ration size goes down to here, then waste also has to be taken off. And so you've got, uh, yeah, and then plugging holes based on directed sampling that we're uh, currently underway uh, trying to do right now. So first, let's try and define the niche in terms of some of the physical habitat. In large lakes, oftentimes uh, temperature really drives much, much of what's going on with the upper trophic level uh, animals, primarily because these are all mobile. Fish can move around, they have uh, their own temperature tolerances, and so they can move to areas that uh, can either optimize their growth or minimize some stress, and so it's often a very strong structuring feature in large lake habitats. And then we'll also consider some of the ecological interactions that are underway, things like what food is available to them, are there competitors that are also uh, potentially reducing that same food supply, and are there predators that uh, could pose significant mortality on these fish directly, or actually take them out of their normal ball game and alter their behavior such that they uh, have either less access to food or it alters their growth uh, in environment in some other way. So how do all these, these factors interact? We often see that these ecological factors are mediated by the environment in which you're in. So you could have the same collection of species in a different lake, and because the, either the bathymetry of the lake or the environmental conditions that are there, you'll see uh, some radically different responses. And so it's, uh, it's a little bit risky to play the game of uh, using anecdotes and applying them from one system to another. Uh, because there are mechanisms that are underway, what we're trying to do is understand these mechanisms because what worked in one system doesn't necessarily work in others. Okay, so we'll go back and, and talk a little bit about the environmental niche. And, and again, this is going to be both a, fact, a, a function of the, the thermal regime within the lake, but also how the fish respond to it. And so we're going to have to delve into bioenergetics briefly uh, to tell you uh, a bit about how fish respond in terms of uh, 
their growth regime across a range of temperatures. What temperatures optimize growth? Which temperatures actually suppress or even put them into a negative growth environment so that they, they may be able to tolerate that for a short period, but over the long run they're going to starve uh, or they'll be debilitated in some other time. Less, less of that energy available for growth, and so naturally they'll grow less. And we'll, what we're going to do now is uh, re remove all but one of the all of these curves, and instead what we're going to do is look at just this, this space here. So how much growth could they enjoy given the temperature regime that they have? And we're going to play around with uh, different feeding rates so that we can look at, say, a very productive system they could feed closer to this 100% of their maximum consumption. At uh, more moderate feeding rates, they may be at 50%, and then down at lower rates would be 25 or less. And so we can look at how these growth relationships change as a result. So here, here's that original, this is the growth curve that uh, would have um, resulted from that first set of curves I showed you in that last slide. And then if we reduce their ration to 50% of the maximum, their growth naturally goes down. But the other thing that happens is that the, the, growth, the temperature at which they grow the best also shifts to a cooler temperature. And then, then that becomes even more extreme if you reduce the, the feeding rate even further. What's probably more important, though, is that their thermal tolerance in terms of them not losing weight also shifts to cooler temperatures here. So there's not much of a change between feeding at their 100% rate or 50% rate. As these lines intersect the, the x-axis here, this is where they would start losing weight if they uh, exceeded those temperature regimes. But if you go from this 50% line to the 20% line, now, instead of being able to tolerate up to about 23 degrees centigrade, now we're backing off to about 17 degrees or so. Okay, so this starts becoming uh, a real pr prohibitive barrier for uh, fish to cross, at least on any sort of a chronic level, because there are real costs involved in them uh, being able to grow. Growing, as you'll see, rela uh, is related to their survival and, of course, reproduction. The bigger these fish are, the more uh, eggs the females can produce. Uh, and so you can have a lot more reproduction, more growth, more survival. Everything's better if you're bigger. So uh, the sorts of things that are going to affect the growth environment are really important in, in terms of defining the quality of the niches that may be available to these fish. The other thing that happens is that not all sizes It's a great pleasure now uh, to introduce Dave Beauchamp. Uh, Dave is, is a fisheries biologist with a, a worldwide reputation. He got his degrees from the University of Washington. He's currently a professor there, along with an appointment uh, through the USGS. Um, oh, Charles, you shouldn't have. Thank you. <laughs> um, and and um, uh, he's, he's worked on Lake Tahoe for a long time after completing his PhD. He actually did a, a postdoc uh, for several years studying the fishes of, of Lake Tahoe. So you're all here to listen to Dave, not to me. Uh, so other than that, unless Charles wants to say something else. Of course. Uh, a brief announcement. Uh, I think uh, all of you knew that Heather got the special award from the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. <laughs> I only found out about it uh, reading the newspaper today. So. <laughs> Good to see you. And, and, when, and when Dave was doing his postdoc here, Charles was, uh, was his advisor. Um, so on that note, thanks. All right. That musical note. Thanks, Jeff. Well, uh, I was trying to figure out, it's been probably 15 to 20 years since I was working up here, so it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to get back involved again. And what I'm going to try and do is piece together some of the information that we've acquired uh, in the past. And we just did get underway about two months ago, so I will be showing you a snippet of what we're doing currently and try and synthesize that uh, in a way that we can start to address a few questions uh, related to this open water food web in, in Lake Tahoe. 
We're focusing on that because historically the Lahontan cutthroat trout were pelagic. And also during my previous stints here in, in Lake Tahoe and, and actually most of the other studies, we've been under a gun in terms of our ability to sample the open water environment for pelagic fish. And so I'm real excited to be able to take that on with uh, more capability now. And I'll, I'll show you what, what we mean as we go.